Hello, and welcome back to another video with me, Mary Harrelkin Bishop. As you can see, I'm sitting in my favorite place in my house when I, a chair, it's a hanging chair that I love to use when I'm reading or when I'm watching TV. And so to read aloud, I thought it would be the perfect place to sit. You can see too, I'm even wearing one of my favorite cozy shirts that I love to wear. So the book I chose today is Moving Forward, The Journey of Paralympian Colette Begonia. So I'll tell you a little bit about Colette before I get started so you know something about her. Uh, Colette was born and raised in a tiny town called Porcupine Plain in Saskatchewan. And there Colette played every sport that she could. She joined every team, even the boys hockey team, because at that time they didn't have a girls hockey team. And Colette was an amazing athlete right from the time she was 10, 11, 12 years old. When she was playing hockey, whenever they wanted to score a goal, they would say, put Colette on the ice because she was that good. When she was 15 years old, she was the senior quarterback for the senior football team because she was that good. By the time Colette was 16, she had dreams and goals for herself. And one of her dreams was that she wanted to go to the Olympics as a runner because running was her favorite thing. When Colette was 18 years old, she was involved in a terrible car accident. She got thrown from the car and when she woke up, she didn't know or she found out pretty quickly that she was paralyzed. She didn't have use of her abs anymore and she didn't have use of her legs. And so this book talks about Colette right from the beginning. It talks about her accident and then it talks about how she decides that she had been an athlete when she was able-bodied and she would figure out how to be, still be an athlete even though uh, she would be a, para, a Paralympic athlete. Prologue, a day like any other day. April the 20th, 1980 begins as any other Sunday for Colette Begonia. She has small plans for the day and bigger plans for the rest of her life. Spring is in the air. It is the season of hope, renewal, and rebirth. Colette is excited and enthusiastic about what the future holds for her. At 18 years of age, she has almost finished high school. Graduation takes place in just two months. She has her whole life ahead of her, and it looks exciting. The Begonia home is already filled with Colette's trophies and medals. In particular, Colette has been widely recognized as an athlete with the potential to further excel nationally in track and distance running. Local newspaper clippings reveal a beaming, confident Colette, proud of her accomplishments in many sports, including track and field, badminton, volleyball, basketball, hockey, and football. Colette is a small town girl with big dreams and great determination. Everyone who knows her has a feeling that she will go far. The people in her small town, hometown of Porcupine Plain, Saskatchewan, 300 kilometers northeast of the big city of Saskatoon, are proud of this young athlete and are anxiously watching to see what she will accomplish next. They can't wait until she puts their little town on the map. They are sure it will happen. The early morning sun beams brightly into Collette's bedroom window. And even though it is the weekend, she rises. Stifling a yawn and throwing back the covers, she jumps out of bed. She has made a running date with Joy Bellick. Although Joy is her teacher and high school track coach, Joy is only a few years, few years older than Colette and the two enjoy training together. They plan to run through the hills and forests surrounding Porcupine Plain. It is a great workout and Colette is looking forward to it. This is what she lives for, to get out of bed each day and be not only active, but pushing toward her goal of being the best athlete she can be. Eager to be off, Colette jumps into her running clothes, pulls on her running shoes and slips quietly out the door. She can eat later. Now is the time to exercise. The early morning calm, in the early morning calm, it feels just like any other Sunday full of the promise of a relaxed day. Colette doesn't know it yet, 
but this day will soon become a pivotal point in her young life. It will be the day of lasts and a day of firsts. For now though, Colette is going for a run. The sun is shining and life is good. The main street is deserted. Colette jogs easily past the closed stores and businesses, her dark hair bouncing on her shoulders. She can see Joy waiting for her at the corner and she feels adrenaline beginning to pump through her body. The two young women push themselves as they run side by side. Colette is already a few inches taller than her petite teacher. Most of her height comes from her lanky legs. The two travel through the sleepy town and onto a path which leads into the trees. Gravel crunches under their feet as they glide along in tandem. They pass the nuisance grounds where a little stream of clear, cool water flows nearby. Colette can hear the water rippling over the rocks as she leaves the stream behind. The day is already heating up and she enjoys the coolness of the shade as they enter the forest. They run for several kilometers. The trail takes them in and out of the pine and spruce trees, through clearings and into thick bush, but Colette barely notices the northern Saskatchewan scenery. She is intent on the run. She enjoys challenging herself to new heights and she is focused on that goal. Colette loves the feeling of power in her legs as her feet push against the ground. Her legs are lean and strong. She feels as if she could run forever and with every step she takes, her arms pump. It feels great to be alive. All too soon for Colette, they turn back toward town. This day is unseasonably warm and without thought, Colette and Joy stop for a few minutes beside the stream. They slip off their shoes and sit on the bank, their feet dangling in the cold water. It is a once in a lifetime moment and Colette relishes in it. I don't know why we decided to do that on that particular day, Colette recalled later. We had run past that stream many times before. That's the first time we ever stopped and put our feet in the water. It was an amazing feeling. Colette pauses in thought and a look of wonder crosses her face. I did a lot of amazing things that day and this was one of them. I was just enjoying life, she says in her typical understated fashion. After the morning run with Joy, Colette grabs a quick breakfast with her family. Her activities for the day are only starting. She has made arrangements to meet some friends for a few games of tennis. As with everything, Colette tackles these games with energy and enthusiasm. It doesn't matter whether she wins or lose, loses. She just loves being outside and active. After tennis, Colette returns home and showers and looks at her school notes for a while before lunch. She has a test coming up and she wants to be prepared. However, through her bedroom window, the afternoon beckons her and she can't resist. For April, it is a glorious day. It feels just like a lazy, hot August afternoon. Eager to be outside again, Colette decides it is the perfect time for a motorcycle ride. She hops on her new motorcycle, a 400 Kawasaki, and revs the engine. She loves the feeling of freedom the bike gives her. There is nothing like a ride in the country with the wind blowing in her face to rejuvenate her spirit. Colette drives around town, through the streets and onto the trails, and then hits the highway, heading to nearby Greenwater Provincial Park. The sun beats down on her back and shoulders. It's 77 degrees Fahrenheit, 25 degrees Celsius. This just doesn't happen in April. It's the kind of day considered a gift and Colette is taking full advantage of it. By the time she put putts back into town a couple of hours later, Colette has added another 100 kilometers to her new motorcycle. It has been an amazing ride, one she will never forget. Colette will hold this ride crystal clear in her memory forever. That night, after a relaxed supper with her family and her boyfriend, Paul, not his real name, Colette and Paul excuse themselves and head outside. They have promised to give Colette's brother Everett a ride to Hudson Bay, a town 80 kilometers northeast of Porcupine Plain. Everett works for the CN National Railway, the CNR, and needs to catch the train there. In exchange for driving him, 
Everett has agreed to let Colette drive his car, a shiny red Mazda. He's very proud of this car, and Colette is honored that her brother trusts his new vehicle to her care. The trip to Hudson Bay takes the trio just under an hour. Colette has brought some school books with her and she studies for her upcoming chemistry test while Everett drives. Paul and Everett chat along the way, but most of their discussion centers on Everett's new car. They talk about the car's engine and power and discuss the features of this and that and other automobiles. Soon they are at the train station in Hudson Bay. Everett gives Colette the keys to his most prized possession and hugs his younger sister goodbye. Paul is itching to drive Everett's new car while Colette would rather use the time to study. So Paul is at the wheel of the shiny new Mazda as they pull out of Hudson Bay and head back to Porcupine Plain. It is a warm evening. The heat of the day still lingers in the air as dust begins to as dusk begins to cast shadows across the land. While Colette studies, Paul enjoys the feel of the car as it cruises along the gravel road heading toward Porcupine Plain. His fingers tap absently against the steering wheel in time to the tunes playing on the radio. About 17 miles, 27 kilometers, outside of Porcupine Plain, the shiny little car nears a slough. Ducks and geese, just returned from the south, are floating on the water. The section of grid road near the slough is soft, as a large accumulation of snow has just recently melted, and the surface of the road is moist and spongy with spring runoff. The Mazda is small and light, and sometimes this lack of weight causes it to hydroplane over the washboard sections of the road. Suddenly, the worst event imaginable happens. The car spins out of control. It careens into the ditch. The little red car doesn't come to a stop in the ditch, though. It rattles and bumps over the rough earth, still speeding ahead like an out-of-control bullet shot from a gun. Mistakenly thinking he has regained command of the car, Paul makes the decision of an inexperienced driver. He tries to pull out of the ditch before the car has slowed enough to accomplish this difficult task. Cranking the steering wheel to the left, he feels the car attempt to climb the steep bank of the ditch. Unfortunately, the vehicle is traveling far too fast. The car pitches and bucks, bouncing from wheel to wheel, then flips over. It rolls several times before it finally comes to a grinding halt. Dust from the gravel road swirls around the demolished vehicle. As the air clears, the horrible aftermath of the accident becomes apparent. Colette has been ejected from the vehicle. She has landed in a farmer's field several meters away from the overturned car. Paul has managed to cling to the steering wheel and stay in the Mazda. Except for a slight limp, he is not hurt. He collects himself and frantically searches for Colette. Once he finds her, he is shocked. She is horribly injured, but she is still breathing. Panicky and scared, Paul half limps, half runs to a nearby farmhouse to get help. The ambulance from Porcupine Plain is soon rushing toward the, engine, the injured Colette with its sirens blaring. It will be days before anyone will know whether Colette will live or die. That's the prologue of moving forward. And then chapter one starts with the early years of Colette and goes through everything. So I hope that you have enjoyed the read aloud about Colette Begonia from moving forward. And I hope that you will pick the book up and read and find out what happens. Talk to you again soon. Keep reading.